Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind Pump. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Stephen Cabral about functional medicine, what functional medicine is, the benefits of seeing a functional medicine doctor versus a traditional medical doctor, and even how trainers and coaches can get certifications in functional medicine to grow their business. All right, enjoy the show. Dr. Cabral, it's always great to have you on the show. Always great to be Some here. of your episodes are some of the most commented, uh, shared episodes of ours. You bring such great information. Um, today, I think we want to focus on just uh, what you do as a functional medicine practitioner, when someone should see a functional medicine doctor, what that looks like, how um, we have a lot of coaches and trainers who listen to the show, how they can maybe utilize some of the skills and testing that you guys utilize or how they can work with people like you to bring their clients more value. But let's start with Functional medicine, what is it uh, and what's different about it versus traditional medicine? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's I call it the basis between sick care and health care. So a lot of people call what they use for their insurance health care. So you go to your PCP, you go to your doctor, and when you go there, you probably get, well, once a year, you get your wellness visit, your health visit, which might be an hour. You go through all of your different blood work, but typically it's only blood work. And we've talked about on this show that blood work is not enough. It's great to diagnose a disease state and you absolutely should run your blood work at least once a year, um, but it stops there. There's no education on nutrition, exercise, sleep, or any of those things that actually lead to a healthy body. So what they're waiting for is something to go wrong in your body for you to be able to be diagnosed with a disease where a blood marker is off. And that is when conventional medicine shines, if you choose to look at it that way, where they give you a pharmaceutical for high cholesterol, high blood pressure, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune, et cetera, right? So that's how that works. And then there is no goal at the end of that. It's just to make sure that the pharmaceuticals are working until you need the next one. And I'm not trying to have a bleak outlook on conventional medicine because it's the absolute best in the world when it comes to acute-based medical. Uh, if something serious happens, you want to make sure that your blood pressure or you're in an accident or emergency room that you're taking care of. But then there's this other half of it, which is called natural health. And they don't do what functional, or they don't do what medical um medical doctors are doing, right? So with natural health, what are you looking at? Well, ideally you're looking at someone's vitamin levels, mineral levels, omega-3s, you're looking at their gut function, you're looking at their hormones. And again, you can do that with functional medicine, which we'll talk about in a moment, but that's more natural health. So just to preempt things, I believe everyone should have their medical doctor, 100%. I just believe everyone should also have a natural health practitioner. We'll call that a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor or a functional medicine practitioner, whatever it may be, that provides the health care not just the sick care. Do you think we're going to blend this in the future? I believe or, that or do you that think they're is, competing. Well, there's a certain ego to all medicine. Mm. So there's like this hierarchy, right? So we have medical doctors and then below that, uh, maybe, or you might even say it's surgeons, right? They look down upon medical doctors and the specialists mm. and the specialists look down upon a PCP because they're not specialized. Right. And then a PCP looks down upon a naturopathic doctor or a chiropractor. And then they look down upon maybe an acupuncturist who looks down upon a nutritionist who looks down upon a personal trainer who then looks down upon a, I don't know, curves, gym, fitness tech. Like, right. It's Thank just like- day, Way down at the bottom. Right? <laughs> it's just all like, it's, that's all that it is. And like, it's just this ego, whereas everyone is doing their own job. They're all amazing. We need them all. Yeah. And what I try to do is create a network. And the network is basically every person, every human should have a network of all these different people to go to because nobody does anybody else's job. So I, I think that there will be a certain blending only because health insurance is now pushing it. And health insurance is tells conventional medicine what to do. So health insurance actually now knows if we keep people healthier, it costs us less money, right. like 60 to 70% less money they found. <laughs> so now they're trying to bring wellness coaching into medical-based practices. Because here's a crazy statistic. I don't know if you knew this, but your medical doctor, again, you guys go to functional medicine, so it's different. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that. But a PCP, your primary care physician, your medical doctor that you typically see, has 3,000 to 5,000 patients, unless they're a concierge doctor, right? They're paid out of pocket. So that's what they're required to do in their practice by health insurance. That's how what makes the numbers work. But that means you're getting a 15-minute visit. Uh, it's in and out. Half the time it's being done to type in their electronic medical records. And again, your PCP is not doing anything wrong. They're just following the system. So the only way that your PCP can give you better quality of care is if the system changes. While health insurance is saying, we need to keep people healthier, but PCPs still need to be doing the number of hours they're doing. Okay, so we bring in then health coaches 
and health coaches can then do all the follow-up for the nutrition, whether it's for registered dietitian or themselves, the exercise, the sleep, all those things that's actually going to get results for health. I believe that that's the future and we're starting to see it now. So who's mm-hmm. going to disrupt it then? Do you think it's going to be the insurance companies? Is that who's I believe gonna... so. Oh, yes. Wow. It saves them they'll tr- make so much money. It costs yeah. a lot it's of really money. Incentivized, for yeah. Yeah, it's um I think it's a pretty fair assessment of the traditional kind of western medicine model. Um do you think it's fair to say that the reason why cuz skeptics or people with really a negative outlook would say, "Oh, they just want to prescribe drugs. It's all about prescription drugs. It's all about symptomatic care." And I get where that comes from. But I do agree with you when it comes to acute issues, like you want to see a Western medicine doctor if you're dying right now or if something really dire is happening. But do you think it's fair to say that what drives a lot of this is, like any industry, is the where the revenue comes in? Okay, So like in our industry, in the fitness industry, a lot of the information that people tend to get online tends to push them in the direction of taking the next supplement. Well, why? Well, supplements are one of the biggest money markers, uh, makers, I should say, in the fitness space. So it makes sense that the content's going to kind of move in that direction. With Western medicine, the biggest money makers are the pharmaceuticals. So it makes sense to me that when you have a symptom, they're going to prescribe a pharmaceutical rather than looking, you know, maybe at the root cause. Would you say that that's kind of fair? I, I think it's absolutely fair. But however, I would say it's not just because it's a money maker. Supplements work, pharmaceutical drugs work, right? So like they're giving you something that actually does work. Yes. So if you have high cholesterol and your PCP wants to lower it, they put you on a statin. It goes down. It goes down. Right. Like it works. But we didn't assess why it was high in the first place, if it's an actually an issue, and we didn't look at how it interacts with other things in the body. Same with a supplement. I have no problem with supplements. But if you're doing that, and we talked about this in the last show, um, if you're doing that to uh, not improve your sleep or to calm your overall stress or remove whatever it might be from your body that needs to be removed, such as toxicities, then that's a problem. So my issue isn't necessarily with pharmaceutical drugs because they should be used in acute-based instances to save your life. So good. But I always say like, well, what's the game plan? So is the game plan to use this pharmaceutical drug to mask your symptoms for the rest of your life? Some people it's yes, because that's what they want. They don't want to do the work, right? Right. I think a lot of people listen to your show, they're willing to do the work. They mm-hmm. just want to know exactly what they're supposed to do. Same with supplements. Okay, so you're low in testosterone. Okay, we're using uh, Adrenal Soothe, we're using daily uh, testosterone support, we're using magnesium, we're using whatever we need to. Good. So is that the plan though for the rest of your life too? Or are we looking to shore up your levels, work on your sleep, three days uh, a week of weight training or whatever you're supposed to be doing based on your program, getting nutrition where it should be, doing intermittent fasting, but not overdoing it. Like, that should be the goal as well. I see. So what I'm saying is that both of them are money makers. They both work. I believe that in a lot of instances, they're both overused and overprescribed. I would 100% agree. What's up, everybody? The giveaway today, MAPS Anabolic. Uh, this is the program that started all. You can win this program by doing the following, leaving a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribing to this channel, turning on notifications, and then if you win... We'll notify you in the comment section. Now, this episode is a good one. We have Dr. Stephen Cabral on. He's our favorite functional medicine practitioner. He's one of our favorites. He's amazing. And he also has put together a certification course. So if you're a trainer or a coach, you're trying to improve people's health, their certification courses will certify you in functional medicine uh, methods, which combine things like Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, Western medicine. And then their level two certification actually allows you to order and analyze labs. So you can do labs for your clients as well. And if you go to ihp.coach forward slash mind pump, you can get $100 off level one or $250 off level two with the code mind pump. Um, And that's pretty much it. Oh, also one more thing, 50% off MAPS OCR right now and 50% off MAPS cardio right now. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Okay, so do you think, because... I've been in the space for a long time and I, years ago, I mean, when I first became an entrepreneur, uh, or at least uh, I don't want to say first, but the second time I became an entrepreneur, I was 24. I opened up a studio. Um, it was a wellness studio and I was just a trainer at that point. I really know much about wellness. I knew proteins, fats, carbs, uh, calories, uh, you know, and exercise, but I knew enough that there's probably a lot of value in, different aspects of of health. Like I knew chiropractors had some value and you acupuncturists had some value. And and back then functional medicine, so you're talking 20 years ago, functional medicine was hard to find, very hard to find. In fact, I, I had heard about it through other health practitioners in my studio, but since then it seems to have exploded. Now I don't think it's as big as it needs to be, 
but it seems to have exploded. Do you think this is a, mar a market response? In other words, people are getting to the point where they're like, okay, my traditional care, healthcare is not working. So let's look at some of this other stuff. Do you think that it's that market response that's making it grow so much? 100%. And so if we kind of go back now over 25 years, I got sick at 17 years old. My immune system just shut down. We didn't know why. Went to over two dozen specialists around Boston. Harvard trained, brilliant doctors. They looked at my blood work. They could see the white blood cells were off, but they didn't know why. Took me two years to actually get a diagnosis of Addison's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, type 2 diabetes, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and a bunch of other things. Okay. The only way that I actually got well was through functional medicine. So a functional medicine doctor, to actually answer your question, is someone that kind of bridges the gap between, let's just say, like overall good, healthy nutrition lifestyle and conventional medicine. There, there's someone with some advanced knowledge that they've studied that's able to then look at both sides, be unbiased and say, hey, everything can work. Who's this right for and when? And so when I found, because this was now 25 years ago, and you're right, they didn't believe in increased intestine, uh, they didn't believe in leaky gut. They didn't believe in all these different mystery-based pains. They didn't believe in adrenal-based issues. So the problem was that even when you you sought out a natural health practitioner, it seemed like woo-woo, right? Because they're talking about all these things yeah. that in the fitness, the best example is the fitness industry. We already knew metabolic conditioning workouts worked 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. We already knew that low carb, you know, worked for weight loss, especially in the beginning years ago. Like we already knew these things. Finally, it makes its way to textbooks and research and then, oh, like, hey, these things actually work. So it's no different. The explosion for it is because of the online world. Because the way that I got into um, not to find a natural health practitioner was word of mouth. And so I had the yellow pages back in the late 90s, no online, not med from Massachusetts, and I had word of mouth. That's it. So you wouldn't even know to look in the yellow pages if you even knew what a functional medicine doctor was and what would it be under. Right. So now with online, well- I mean, every day you just go on a chat feed and you'll be able to see yeah. hundreds of people making recommendations. Well, since you've been doing this for so long, I would imagine that uh, there's a bit of a self-selection bias with your patients in the sense that you're not the first person they came to see. You're the fifth or sixth or 10th person. That, yeah, so, are you ever the first right. person? So they're coming. Actually, no. I was going to say, you're probably <laughs> yeah. never the first person. Al almost never. So that's resort almost. That's yeah. my question because I I'm assuming the vast majority of people come see you when they're like, they've exhausted all traditional methods. They're fed up. It's been five years. I can't figure this out. It's ruining my life. Fine. I'm going to go see this, you know, let me, let me seek, seek out this last option or whatever. Are you starting to see more people now that are coming to you sooner, not waiting until it's like, this is my last resort? So how I got my start is 18 years old, uh, became a certified nutritionist, became a certified personal trainer. At 17, I was just working gym floors, you know, cleaning up sweat off machines, those types of things. And that was my start to the industry. I started just collecting certifications because you had to get CEUs anyway, CEC. So I just got new certification, new certification, new certification, got my strength and conditioning uh, specialist, CSCS. All these things are great. And then I said, okay, I'm still working on my overall health. Finally met my mentor. I'd met a lot of great practitioners, but Typically, people meet one person that they connect with. I connected with this person. They taught me what I needed to do to get well. I got well. I said, okay, I want to study this. I went back, got my degree in naturopathy. So I'm a doctor of naturopathy, which is interesting too, because you're also told that you're supposed to take the ego out of it. Meaning like you take from Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, you right. take at-home lab testing. You don't even care. Like, well, who's right? So people are like, hey, do you use homeopathy? I'm like, well, not really. I mean, I don't use that very much in my practice, but I'm not against it. Like, I'm not taught to look, I don't, well, everybody's kind of taught to judge what's good and bad. Like, I have a bias against conventional medicine. I know that. I say that up front because conventional medicine put me where I am back when I was 17. Mm. I was put on antibiotics at 14 years old through 17 years old. I was on it for three years. Oh, for my acne. gosh. Because they give antibiotics for acne because it can be bacteria that's causing yeah. your acne. So imagine swallowing 3,000 capsules of antibiotics, how that would destroy your gut, mm -hmm. right? But the dermatologist, why would he ever think about your gut when he's doing it for acne, mm -hmm. right? And when I was a child growing up, our pediatrician gave us, uh, we literally had Z-Packs. Remember Z-Packs? Yeah. Yep. I had Z-Packs in my closet. Is it from Isen? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly right. So my mom, PCP was tired of us coming in for like a common cold he would give them out. My mom had four kids under six years old. And so we're all like 12 to 18 months apart. So she had enough to think about. So anytime we get sick, 
Here's your Z-Pack. I would take a Z-Pack three, four, five times a year. I had the worst allergies in the world because obviously I had gut health issues. None of this was ever connected. So, you know, when I speak negatively against conventional medicine, it's not against medical doctors. It's not against your PCP. It's against the system that's taught when they go to school. So when I went to school, okay, you everybody learns physiology, kinesiology, toxicology, et cetera, the first couple of years. Then medical doctors go on to learn about pharmacology. And they say, when this comes up on a test, you give this. And again, I have no particular issue with that in acute-based circumstances. In naturopathy, we say, okay, after that, what are we going to learn? Well, we're going to learn healthy lifestyle. We're going to learn about herbs. We're going to learn about vitamins. We're going to learn about all these different things. And then after you graduate, a medical doctor or an acupuncturist, nurse, uh, doctor of naturopathy, et cetera, can go and then study functional medicine, which then they use specific lab testing. So it's it's actually postdoctoral work that you do that gives you that extra little ability to do that. So it's not any like anyone could be a functional medicine doctor. The one thing I would be a little bit weary of saying is that a functional medicine doctor only does, you know, one thing like um you know, the most, the most prevalent is like bioidentical hormones mm. because then, and, and I know that you've talked about your experiences on the show, mm. they, they took a weekend course. They don't have the knowledge base mm-hmm. that you want for your own health. And now you know the difference because you've gone to someone else, Dr. Rand, I believe that you've said yeah, before, yeah. who's fantastic. And he can give you the right dosage for you based on your own body and then tweak it as needed. And so what I don't like is what's called green medicine this niacin is for your depression, right? Vitamin B3. This is for your low estrogen. We just do this. So I'm hoping that we get to an industry that starts to incorporate everything from the benefits of exercise, the benefits of nutrition, the benefits of sleep, the benefits of supplements, the benefits of even pharmacological. If you were to, if you were to build the super doctor, like what education and path would you, would you take them through? It's interesting because the, the best, practitioners or doctors I know are not typically medical doctors. And I'm not saying that with any unbiased because I have colleagues that are brilliant medical doctors, brilliant. But what happens is it's the lens that shapes you that allows you to even look into and have the passion for the field that you're in. So when most people graduate, they never read another book. They read one book a year. Like, let's be honest, like mm-hmm. your Most doctors or most, just pick any industry. I'm just going to pick on medical doctors for today because again, it's the industry. They have no real use to read any more books because it would not have any bearing whatsoever on their ability to read the lab, make an assessment, and then make a pharmacological intervention, Mm -hmm. give, give your pharmaceutical. Now, that's why I love the field of health and fitness. There's always new information. There's always different takes. There's always little nuggets. And not just for personal training and nutrition, but myself, uh, again, working as a doctor of naturopathy, I like to read as many books as I can. Maybe the information isn't new, but it's presented in a different way. And it gives me a different lens to view it and then be able to then, you know, cue my client, wellness client in a little different way. Because maybe the way I'm saying it, they don't get it, right? So you need to tell them three, four different ways, like to how to perform a Romanian deadlift, right? Uh, hey, keep the weight on your heels, push your hips back, slightly bend the knees, Feel the stretch in your hands. Like sometimes it doesn't, the same cue does not work for every individual. So that's what I go back to. So if I'm building the perfect person, it's someone that is passionate about the field of health. It's not a job. It's someone that loves to learn because everything can be taught and that there's no potential to their growth. If you show me that individual, mm-hmm. all they do is give them the books, give them the study, give them the ways to go, the internships, and they'll learn it. You've also studied um, uh, non-traditional forms of medicine uh, like uh, Ayurvedic medicine Mm -hmm. and even Chinese medicine. What are some strengths and weaknesses of those? So, and the only reason, so I studied those because my mentor, Dr. Pete, actually had a a deep background in Ayurvedic medicine. And although I had looked into it in my like 25, 26, early 20s, mid 20s, um, it was one of the ways in which I got well. And the difficult thing about Ayurvedic medicine is that we want to break it down to a quiz. You know, which dosha are you? Pitta, vata, mm. kapha. And it's the world's oldest form of medicine. It's it's based out of India? It's based out of India, okay. Kerala, India. Okay. And it's so in-depth. And so the, the brilliant thing about it is it's all just about bioindividuality. And it's trying to teach it in a way 6,000 years ago about how they spoke and we're translating it. So there's so much brilliance in it. But here's the thing. I didn't get well for 10 years. I went through every program, every protocol, every supplement, and I would get better for a little while and then relapse. And I'm like, 
you know, I'm just never going to get well. And it was a really bad state, you know? So like training and nutrition was my savior because I was able to at least feel like I was getting an outcome from the work I put in, meaning I could get myself in shape. And that to me was like tremendous. And it helped me not relapse quite as much. But on the inside, I still was getting like bronchitis in the winter. I was still getting pneumonia. I was still relapsing my immune system where it wasn't needed to be. I had I felt like a zombie flu-like symptoms, um, all sorts of different things. But so I said, uh, I've tried everything. Yes, I'm going to try to follow in the footsteps of my mentor, but I'm actually going to go study overseas. I'm going to actually see what actually works in these clinics. So I interned in clinics uh, in about six clinics all over India. Oh, wow. Sri Lanka, China, in a traditional Chinese medicine um, hospital in old Beijing. And I was in uh, Europe and the Netherlands studying functional medicine as well. And then all over the US. Wow. Now, anything surprising? Like, did you go in with certain expectations to come out? I did. I went in with expectations that uh, every single one of them was going to work uh, amazingly well. And what I realized was not everyone was ready for the particular treatments that were there. It worked for the right people who would get benefit from that treatment. Mm. So I'll say it in a different way. There is every modality in the world works that I know of. Um, that's TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, let's include acupuncture or things like that in it. If you needed that treatment, then it helped you. Mm -hmm. Which is why if people are so radical and passionate about That's it. That's right. Because right? it works wildly well for like a third of the people. Yeah. And then, no, I don't want to say this about Ayurveda because Ayurveda is so in-depth. It's like, okay, well, we did Panchakama. We did like certain treatments. Um, but Ayurveda is also a philosophy of life and balance about your body. So it's always going to work when you look at the deeper philosophy. But like acupuncture is not going to work for everybody. It's not going to help you get rid of candida. It's not going to help you get rid of parasites, not to that degree. Now, it can be phenomenal for inflammation, pain relief, sleep, anxiety, anything to do with the nervous system. It can be fantastic. Yeah. And I saw it work, but I saw it did not work for these people with these particular issues. Mm -hmm. So what I learned was this, because I went into it with a skeptic's mindset, because I basically said, I'm going to do the practice, like TCM, Ayurveda, uh, bioregulatory medicine in, in, in the Netherlands, like all these different types of medicine. I call them the seven forms of natural health or integrative health. And what I realized was everything works at the right time for the right person. So we can't be a practitioner that only has one tool in the toolbox, as they say, right? Like it's not going to work. We were joking around earlier, Justin, about when kettlebells first came out, um, it was kettlebell only workouts yeah. as if like dumbbells stopped being effective, bands, you know, barbells, like your own body. They're work. obsolete like it had all of a sudden. Yeah. That's, it. That's all you have. Yeah. And so it's, it's difficult because- well, there are other things that do work. And so I want to be able to just draw upon the wisdom from every different form of medicine. And that includes conventional medical uh, as well. And so if I need to refer out, I refer out. And I'm mm. okay with that. It's so funny because you, you you speak about uh, medicine the same way that I think we we speak about strength training. There's so many different modalities. And I always feel like, that, and it's the same path, right? There's a third of the people that will go try CrossFit or will go try yoga or will go try powerlifting or go try bodybuilding and it will change their life. Mm -hmm. And then they become these evangelists for that modality. And the truth is they all work. Yes. But, I mean, and and the I think the best practitioner is somebody who's versed in a, in a little bit or a lot of all of it so that you can apply it to each individual. Well, and the, mo and the reason why that's so important is because, okay, it's going to work phenomenally well. This includes nutrition plans as well, right? So- carnivore diet, keto diet, phenomenally well for a third. Yeah. For a third, I didn't feel anything, right? You can see the people's reviews. Yeah. For a third, I felt worse. Yeah. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, it means that as a practitioner, you're going to help about a third of the people with your particular program. Now, for the people you don't help, <clears throat> what do you do? Well, you either better be able to refer out, take your ego out of it because mm -hmm. it's what's best for the individual or, hey, this didn't work. I know why. Let's move on to this. Yeah. Right? Are you are you seeing, because you've been doing this for a while and culture shifts and pop, well, popular culture shifts quite a bit in the sense that, you know, I mean, when we were kids, if somebody was trying to eat healthy, quote unquote, they were eating low fat and then it was low carb. And then, you know, now we're seeing uh, this push both, uh, you know, even politically to for people to go plant-based or vegan, for example. Are you starting to see things pop up more commonly because of that, where you get the average person who says, yeah, I saw this documentary called What the Health. I'm just going to eat you know, vegan from now on, and then they don't feel good or whatever, and they come see you. Are you starting to see more trends or different yes. trends? 
Well, whatever the trend is, we see it. And it's um, it'll never change because people want new, what's new and exciting and they always hold out hope that this is the thing. And so when you have the silver bullet mentality, <coughs> you're always going to believe that it's, oh, I'm just one more diet away. I'm just one more exercise plan away. Instead of looking at the holistic picture that it's not just diet, it's not just exercise, it's sleep, it's stress, it's toxins, it's all of these particular things. One of the things we used to find is that people, People did consider us the last stop. They just said, okay, I'm going to try one more thing. I'm going to go to Dr. Cabral. I'm going to go to his team, whatever it may be. But over the last few years, I've actually been pleasantly surprised by this, is that a lot of people are doing preventative-based health. And even though sometimes I make fun of the biohacking community, just obviously tongue-in-cheek, um, just because of some of the things that are so outrageous that people are doing, it's actually spawned a lot of good discussions and a lot of good media in terms of using infrared sauna running your labs, doing cold plunge. Like sometimes yeah. it's taken to excess, but it's brought way more awareness. And sometimes people's first entry into anything, like I used to say it back in the day at Curves, you know, Curves Fitness. Yeah, I used to make fun of it and like joke around, but then I realized like, that's not intimidating. They know the eight exercises they're going to do the machines. And then it gets them to take the next step, which might be like Planet Fitness. And then after that, they hire a personal trainer. And so it's like, it's this stepping stone. So if people's first entry into natural health is doing a sauna or doing even a supplement, I'm good with that. So are you are you saying that part of your protocol for your, your anybody that has gut issues is butthole sunning? Is that what you're <laughs> I've actually I've actually <laughs> seen that. I just I thought it was amazing that uh that that's a thing. But there's yeah. a th as a thing for everybody. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we evolved so. to not have the butthole exposed to the sun. Yeah. It's in there, it's back there and sure. sheep for a reason. Well Imagine hidden. if that was the cure, right? That was the <laughs> yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think people just want to show their buttholes on Instagram. Um very, no, you know, the thing with curves, which was interesting, um, because I saw that come up, explode, become the number one chain, and then crash. But one thing I saw them do very well is they gyms back then were trading members, like fighting for the same members. Curves penetrated the market that yeah, nobody was touching. Disrupted it completely. Disrupted it completely. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there was something there you could, you could definitely take from. And um, I think that's kind of what you're talking about with these different methods and how functional medicine <clears throat> um, kind of looks at all these different things. So with with all these different methods that you and I didn't realize, God, that you had that extensive experience with all those different modalities, which I think is so incredible. I know that you offer a certification for our trainers and coaches or people that are aspiring to be one. Um, how, how did, did you take from all of those to build this? What did that, what did that process look? I'm so curious to, of putting that together, what that looked like. Well, that that's what it was and it was never intended. So when I was a, a personal trainer and nutritionist it and a strength and conditioning specialist, it was me trying to teach others what I loved to do and that was helping me. And so then I found something else that also really worked and that was, We'll call it naturopathy or na basically natural health. And I wanted to share that with other people too. And then I started running at-home lab tests and I'm like, oh, this really works now. Because what I knew before was all of the lifestyle and nutrition and even supplementation. But now I can tell you, not if you might need it, but yes, you definitely do need it or you're using too much of it. And so that to me was like, I love, I love the science behind it. I love the data. I love the numbers. I love the detective work. And so all I ever tried to do was up level my education and learn more. And I was always I was always questioning things, but I was also very skeptical. So the skepticism also led me not to do certain things. And I think that was good too. So I'm trying to teach people what works the best, what doesn't work, and include everything. So we include uh, bioregulatory medicine, uh, which is basically uh, the original form of functional medicine over in Europe, mainly Germany and mm. Switzerland. Uh, it's it's amazing. Still practiced to this day. Um, I included Ayurvedic medicine, herbalism, or traditional Chinese medicine as well, um, in Eastern based philosophy. And a lot of people, like when I when I wrote my book too, the Rain Barrel Effect. One thing I try to share with people is that we have a lot of science behind the nutrition, the exercise, the stress reduction, the toxin removal, all those things. But a lot of times, what's bothering people are emotional based traumas. Um, and, and mental blocks that they're not able to get past. They're the victim of a disease. And anytime you see yourself as the victim of something, you lose control. So what I try to do is as much as I can and, and being as sensitive as I can to help people take back control of their health. Because we always have the statistic 168 hours, right? 168 hours, the number of hours a week you have with you. Let's say that you guys are the best personal trainers, you're the best coaches, you're the best whatever in the world. No matter what, nobody's seen you for more than two hours a week, yeah. maybe three, right? 
So at the end of the day, I need to be able to instill in someone what to do and how to do it, not just take this one thing or you know, do that. You know, it's funny. They have studies that show that um, they'll put groups of people in the same situation, but one group feels like they have some autonomy and they have better immune systems, better blood marker, just because they feel like they're more in control. Then you read the accounts of like POWs and people who've been in really terrible situations. They say that one of the ways to survive is to control what you can and to give yourself that sense of autonomy. Um, and they did it in very structured, small ways for what they could, but just that alone. So I think the, the biohacking community, like you said, you know, I agree with you, a lot of the stuff they do is silly. But one thing that they did do is they got a lot of people to start to look at how they can empower themselves, right? Like, okay, what can I do? What are the things I can change? Let me do some more reading. And that's a big problem, I think, in uh, Western health, uh, traditional Western health is we've taken the power away from people where you just go do what someone tells you and, you know, don't ask any of the questions or whatever. And um, I think that's terrible. I think you need to understand that first off, as good as your doctor is, you are the one that ultimately suffers from the negative consequences of poor health, or you're the one that benefits ultimately from great health. It's your responsibility. You have to take it in under your control. So this is a, a bit of an odd question, but because we went the biohacking direction, uh, you're just somebody who I'd be super curious to hear how you answer this. Um, do you do you have a, a favorite biohacking tool that we've seen invented or that we've seen get popular in the last decade that you think has the most application or has been the most beneficial for your your average person? Is there anything that pops out to you? Well, I mean, the it's the one that people are willing to use the most that's less inv least invasive. Right. <clears throat> and I know, and I know that part of, I'm going to stop you or interrupt you right before you go. Cause I know that you're going to have the, 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 the perfect answer of that, the individual and everything like that. But I, I'm, I'm more curious to your per opinion yeah. on like what, what you like or what you think is the coolest. So in my opinion, there is nothing better than the aura ring right now. Ah. And the reason is, is that if I want to wear a watch, I want to wear a watch. So that cancels out the whoop and it cancels out the Fitbit. Although you can wear the whoop on your forearm, you can now wear it on your ankle. So I like that, that you can put it in different, less mm -hmm. conspicuous places. So I'm not against that. Um, I've used the bio strap, which I like, no, no problem at all. Worn on the wrist. Um, the winner though, will not be the aura ring in the long run. It's most likely going to be a patch, some type of wearable patch mm. that you can put anywhere. Because also, we think, so why do I like the aura ring? And again, I'm not a, sponsor. I, I don't get sponsored by them. I don't get anything. Yeah. Like they might send me a sweatshirt in the mail, like great job. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't even know. But the reason is, is that it gives you quantifiable data on what you're doing. Are you getting better or worse? Like the signals aren't even perfect. The HRV is incorrect. It's lower than it should be, but it's your baseline every day. Um, and now it is getting better. So it's actually looking at cycle mapping for women. It's looking at your oxygen now, mm. which again, it's not perfect but it's getting better. It looks at your deep sleep. It looks at your REM sleep. They're using their own algorithms. It's not perfect, but it gives you your baseline. So people need also on the way to health, you need to have wins along the way. So if you're not feeling better yet, but you're improving your HRV by, you know, three points, five points, and you go from a, you know, a 25 to a 28, you're doing something correct. If your REM sleep starts to go from under an hour to now over an hour, you're on your path to wellness. So before you ever lost the weight as a personal training client or got healthy as a health client, you can start to see those numbers move in the right positive direction. So that's the reason why I like it. I also like it that you can put it on airplane mode. So you don't need to have these devices sending signals to you and your phone all day long. And I think that in the future, when we live in literally a scanning based you know, biometric EMF soup. I think that that's probably going to matter. Yeah, oh, cool. it's, it gives you your, uh, you can see your trends, right? Yeah. Like well, I mean, results. you know me, I'm like, that's a, that's totally an answer I would give. Yeah. I think when uh, the, these types of tools, uh, when we when they came out, it was game changer for me. And I, I'm one of the people that defend, and I defend all of them for the, for the simple point that you made, which is it gives me a baseline. I don't give a shit yeah. if you want to make <clears> the <throat> argument that it's, nine, this one's 97% more accurate, this one's 67. It's like, to me, it's that if it's, it's consistent. if it's yeah. consistent with the data it's reading me, boy, I mean, other otherwise I'm guessing. And so at least now I have a, a, a really good educated guess on whether I should increase calories, focus more on sleep or not. So well, I'm it right seems with you like, on that. Yeah, the, this whole approach and everything, um, it's, it's really like it's an aggregation of as much data as possible, right? So it would make sense that like having sensors and including some data 
from lifestyle would be very important to be able to then sort of do your detective work of which um, sort of method would apply best for these individuals. Is that something that you're kind of going through that as through the certification, you kind of teach them through that? Yeah. So even if we look at it, a lot of what we do is at home lab testing. So it's phenomenal, but how often you're running at home lab testing too, right? I mean, at the most, probably once a quarter. And so when you look at it, what do you have? Well, you have biometric data on a daily basis and it will get better when it's real time. So there's nothing you can do about these numbers in real time, except like your steps, right? But eventually there'll be what's called haptic feedback. So there's a company, Hanu Health, um, Dr. Jay Wiles, who's a great guy, Dr. Patrick McEwen, and, and a few other people. And what they're looking at is heart rate variability. So your heart rate variability signal gets weaker the further the strap, like, you know, the polar chest straps. Okay, it's gonna be best on that. You go to the forearm, pretty good. You go to wrist, okay, better. You go to your hand, it's a weaker signal. But again, it just matters, like, what are your trends? But what they're gonna find, um, and they're in the infancy of it, but they're, they're, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, it's there. It's just gonna get better and better. They just need a way to let you know at the time when you're under stress and your HRV is plummeting. So on our last show, we talked about cortisol. Well, it'll tell you when your heart rate uh, variability drops a couple different standard deviations, you'll get actually a buzz. You'll get something either to your phone or right on your chest that will tell you like, and I've done this before because I've, I've done the like original database models, um, breathe, oh, um, relax, and it'll catch cool. you in real time. So that's I cool. believe the future of biometrics is that. Yeah. We're not there yet, but it's getting close. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so with the- Doug uh, will be buzzing all day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> move away from Adam. <laughs> okay, so the Integrative Health Practitioner Certification. Yes. Uh, I have some questions about that. So what are- you mentioned you can do labs with that or you can read labs. So is that that's one of the things that you could do. So if a coach or trainer is listening right now and they got this certification, one of the things that they'll come out of that with is that they can, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, prescribe labs. Hey, I think you should do this lab. I think you should do that lab, you know, hair test, blood, saliva, whatever. Then when they get the results, they can read them and then advise based off them. Is that yeah. what they, okay. So basically our goal is two things. One, if you have health issues, teach you how to heal yourself. And then we say heal others. Because when you find something that works, you want to shout it from the rooftops. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to do. And that's that's level one. That's the diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest and sleep protocols. So you're getting protocols for all of these, not supplements. You're actually getting protocols of what to do. Emotional-based uh, stress, scientifically-based supplement protocols, and then success mindset. Basically, the art of coaching. You know, like how to motivate a client to do what they need to do for themselves and for others. Level two is where they now know all the protocols that they can implement when they find something on these at-home labs that have gone wrong. So if testosterone is low, if estrogen is high, if there's candida overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, if there's heavy metals, okay, you learn how to read the labs. We teach you how to read them so that you can actually then use this information to help clients get to the next level. So we call it, you know, putting a health coach in every home. That's our goal. So a lot of people in our programs are uh, nurses, personal trainers, acupuncturists, chiropractors. It's people who are already kind of in the in-between helping clients with health and fitness. We actually have a lot of estheticians in the program too because they're seeing skin-based issues yeah. and they're treating the outside when it's most likely gut issues yeah. or hormonal, hormonal issues. So now we can help the esthetician take their practice to the next level. Because in my opinion, most natural health practitioners, and I'm putting that in fitness and wellness and chiropractors, they're all just, they're passionate. They're looking to help their clients get the best results possible. So there's two things you can do. You can refer out if you have the knowledge of who to refer out to, which I think is great. And I know Sally, I used to do that. Oh, yeah. Or <clears throat> you can start to take on some of these responsibilities yourself. And by responsibilities, I mean, be the go-to person that your client's want and need and help them actually introduce them now to food sensitivities. That's an easy one to get started with, or just hormonal health or, um, you know, your vitamin levels. Like people should know their levels or omega-3 levels. Cause then you can be like, Hey, you weren't eating any uh, wild salmon. Now you are, and you've improved your inflammation levels. Like we can actually quantify these results. So I found it does two things. One, obviously your clients are going to get results, but it's going to bring in then like your, for your career wise, a whole new avenue of people you would never have reached because not everybody wants a personal trainer, but they may want a health coach. And so you're getting lots of referrals for that. But the other thing too, is it keeps your knowledge and interest in the industry 
just continuing. To I wish. So I used to. I would, I, I would have killed for this. Uh, so I, I, I yes. <laughs> I so I teach trainers and coaches um, all the time. When I talk to them all the time, I teach them to be mavens. I say find practitioners that you can refer to, that you can work to, and the ones I always recommend are functional medicine, acupuncture, body work specialists. Um, and then anywhere else you think that may help, but find those people, but that's so hard to do, right? You got to find the right person. Will they work with you? Then you got to communicate with them, with their clients. I wish I had something like this. I would have loved to been able to, A, order labs, because you can't do that as a, just a regular person. So I wish I could have ordered labs and then B, read them and then based off of those, combine them with my fitness knowledge and be able to say, okay, John, I know now why this strength training program is not working for you as good as it normally, as it should. I can see here, your stress hormones are too high. So let's do this first. I used to do that with a functional medicine practitioner. I would talk to them, we'd go back and forth and put together a protocol and it, it was so successful, it worked so well. But man, I wish I had. You know what? You know what's the? I actually was on. I went on a rant last night because I actually was talking to all these trainers and coaches about not utilizing all of our free resources that we have. And there's this weird scarcity mindset, and I, I feel it's it it it's big in our space. Like just these trainers and coaches, a lot of times are fearful that oh, if I send them over to Doctor Cabral and they have to get the supplements, and they do things, they're no longer going to buy from me, and that's going to hurt my business. Oh no, it's, it's the opposite. It is the opposite. That's why I went. I was like yelling at them on the on the, on the phone last night because I was so frustrated. I'm like, this is what made me really successful because I was. I was the youngest trainer. I was the least educated, the least experienced, but then I had the most success because I was not afraid to farm out. I was not afraid to be like, oh, I'm not sure, but I, I know a guy or I know a girl. Like, And I never lost business because of that. No, they stay with you longer. They do. And they refer you out to more people and then you become that person. There's, It's weird though in our space, we get like this sometimes. Well, and, I've, I've, and I totally agree with you. <clears throat> and you need, to, you need to actually see it for yourself. But what happens is this. If you are the go-to person for this person's health, you're invaluable. Yep. So you know the meal delivery company, you know the right supplements, you know the chiropractor, you know the kinesiologist, you know the functional range conditioning specialist, you know the acupuncturist. If you know all these people, of course, this client is never going to leave. That's like what I became. Going to be with yeah. Yeah, I became the maven. Yeah. That's right. And so the, the maven's from a book, right? There's different, uh, like the different like connectors and the different yes. people, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good analogy right there. Remember that. Um, so that's what you want to be. So even if you don't want to become an integrative health practitioner, although I'm telling you right now, you need to be able to learn how to read your own labs for yourself, your family. Like that's if you true. have kids one day, like you just need to have at least a knowledge base. So when this comes back, you can say, is this really true? Yes or not? A yes or no? And if the answer is no, you don't have to have even all the answers, but you at least know what is right and what is wrong and what to look at. Like, yeah. so it takes you to that next level. The other thing is too, and I would love to get all of your opinion on this. I've just seen that they shut down gyms. They shut down personal yeah. training studios. They mm -hmm. shut down wellness studios. They shut down estheticians. You want to have some virtual aspect of your practice, in my opinion. I, I just agree. It's that. completely oh, moving yeah. that direction. Yeah. So you know? it's, it's if it's going virtual and you yeah. can work with anyone anywhere, be the go-to person no longer in your community to give the car because the chiropractor can't meet with them either if this happens again. Yeah. So what about now if you can order the labs, give nutrition, give again, you're not giving registered dietitian plans. You're giving, and I do have to make a disclaimer, we're not um prescribing any medical advice. We're not teaching you to practice medicine. We're teaching you to practice health coaching. You become a certified yes. health coach through the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute. And you can actually become board certified because our certification holds up. We have the highest level of certifications. Wow. So you actually can get board certified as a holistic health coach, um, which has a lot of weight. So then you can start to work with, again, these doctors. You have the you have the Okay, background. that's a great point. So to be clear, um, you can, because there's a lot of online coaches that listen to our show. Um, and they help people through exercise, nutrition online. It's just, you, you know, you, you don't have to charge as much. You can do, you know, you can help more people. You can yeah, reach a larger audience, right? It's easy to scale. And a lot of people like that. They like helping people that way. So with this, you can literally, same thing, order the lab for them. Even if, if I'm in California, they're in Florida, I could order the labs. They can get, they can do the test, send it in themselves. I get the results. I can look at them with the person over the phone or over the internet and say, okay, this is low. This is high. Let's try supplementing with this. Let's try this particular thing in your diet. Let's try more or less exercise, whatever. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So then you can start to use a lot of those modalities, which is the sauna, sleep, 
food, yeah. higher carb, lower carb. Like if you have, uh, especially again, we've chatted about this before. Okay. You have a woman in your practice. She's 37 years old. She has two kids. She's not getting the sleep that she should. You put her on a low carb diet. It seems to be working. Then six weeks later, she plateaus. Okay. What do you do? Do you go lower carb? Do you go lower calories? Do you exercise her more? Like yeah. what's the plan to keep losing weight? Let's look at our home runs. That's what we need to do, right? So now you have the ability to do that and you can actually show, here's why you plateaued. Okay, now we know what's going on. We could do cycle low carb and then we have to back, move back into some refeeding meals or something like that that's best for your body. Okay, intermittent fasting is great, but 14 hours seems to be the sweet spot from you from six at night to eight in the morning, not fasting until noon. And you're able to show all of these things now, the things that you know that you've been taught and actually prove them out. So <clears throat> personal trainers are some of the people that have the most success because it's a natural add-on. Like it's a bolt onto your practice because you're learning. One of the hardest parts is actually to learn how to create an exercise program. Yeah. Like that's oh, not yeah. easy no, to do. To individualize so if you get it. that and you've, you've been doing nutrition probably with your personal training, so you get a little bit of that. Okay, now what's the next thing? I would have gotten better so much faster because oh, yeah. you know I got good at what I did and we talk about this all the time. So the three of us did this for about the same amount of time. I got what I, good at what I did through trial and error. Asking questions that didn't work, this does work, and then eventually, after you know, fifteen years of training, hundreds or thousands of people by proxy, I start to see this works, that doesn't work, whatever. To have like data and to have labs and to try something like what I would do now with all of this is I would take a client and say we're going to do these tes tests to start because we're just getting started. I want to see where we're at now. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to start this program based on what I think is going to be best for you based off those tests, based off your fitness history, your lifestyle, that kind of stuff. Then three months later, we're going to run these tests again and see, and I'm going to see if I can connect the changes in your labs with what we've noticed subjectively. You you're sleeping better. You feel better. You're stronger. Wow. I can see this thing in your lab got much better. I can see this is working or maybe I can see now why it's been a little bit more struggle for you or why you've been plateauing a little bit. So, I mean, I think oh, this is- I would take it as valuable. Yeah. I mean, it's it, the thing is, it's like it's the specificity of it because like you said, like you had to learn over years of how to ask the right questions to even get to that lifestyle, like really like a good uh, visual picture of that uh, to be able to kind of find those specific screws. You could just tighten a bit. Uh, that's not, that's going to move the needle the, the furthest. And so to be able to have like the labs really identify that a lot earlier uh, would, would be massive for a personal I, trainer. I would take it even a step further. I would, I would build it into my pricing. Oh, a hundred percent. It would be a part of the whole thing. Yeah, I would build it into my price. Most people sell training by either the, the sessions or monthly services or whatever, or by the package of what you train for this long with me. And I would actually just do exactly what you said. Like part of my assessment, yeah. is these labs are, it's, I, it comes with this total price. And imagine and, how you can paint build it. Yeah. And you can paint the picture. Yeah. Here's what it looks like to, you know, this is what we're going to start with three yeah. months later. And then you build look the at. plan. Yeah. 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 You know, and you got yourself now a nine month or year plan that you could present to someone and really provide tremendous value. What, what exact, which labs specifically are you able to look at and read through this certification? So, and, and I just want to get to your point, our most successful, <clears throat> our most successful coaches in the program are actually a lot of personal trainers that are developing packages like that. Yep. Oh, okay. So your typical so package, oh, it's, it's four weeks, it's 12 weeks. Okay. No, now it's six months. Yes. And it includes certain nutritional supplements, certain, um, you know, I don't know if it's meal delivery, whatever you want to do in the labs. And the reason is that I don't have to sell nutritional summits. I don't sell nutritional summits. If I run an, an omega-3 inflammation test with you and the standard American is an 18 to one, well, let's say you're not the standard American. Most people in our practice are doing a pretty good job on their nutrition. So they're a 10 to one. I'm not selling you nutritional summits. You can either take an omega-3 supplement or you can eat wild fish right. three to four times a week. Your choice. Yeah. But the lab is telling you, yeah. you have higher levels of inflammation. Again, I'm just showing you what it is. You decide what you want to do. So it, it makes the whole process of helping someone make the right decision. It, it's just, there's no feeling or emotion to it. It is what it is. And we're going to help you get to that point the fastest way possible. The other thing is this, you're no longer a commodity. When everybody yeah. went online and everybody is a personal trainer, how are you different? You know, you're using this fitness app. You're using it. Okay. Good. So is the next guy. So is the next girl. 
So it's like, well, what are you doing? Oh, well, I actually customize your nutrition plan uh, based on your food sensitivities. Oh, well, that, that, that's a step up. Oh, I actually customize your days of workout based on your cortisol levels and your testosterone or, yeah. you know, whatever it might be. And so like, this is taking it to that next level. I believe I've always wanted to take personalization in the fitness industry to this next level. I believe that there's a lot of personal trainers, not all of them, but a lot of personal trainers are ready to separate themselves at that next level. That's what I try to do in my wellness studio. Oh, I, I just didn't do it myself. It's the thing all yeah. three of us had in common. Yeah. Right? yeah, We didn't know each other. We're all doing, had success in different directions, but, and we all did it in different ways, yep. like how we mm -hmm. package things, but it was the taking the service to another level. Like everyone's always trying to compete in price and stuff like that. It's like, we all knew better to go the opposite direction. It's like, no, you, yeah. You bring you bring a whole other level of value to and that. The success, value, yeah. the and success you had I had when my clients went it exploded because they could see me, they could see this other person, this other person. We could communicate, work together, and measure the results, the success, work with the client, and the success was phenomenal. I, mean, I, I just can't imagine how powerful because I I can just, oh my gosh, I can just see I myself that, sitting. I'd run crazy I've had uh, <laughs> thousands of conversations of sitting down with a client and we're assessing the diet and I'm I'm telling them what I think they should or shouldn't do or adjusting things. I just can't believe how powerful it would be if I had labs sitting right well, next to me and going, "What you could do is we could you know I'd like you to eat fish three times a week, but if you don't, then I want you to take this. Well, I want you to you know that just would be to give you an example like. I, you know, I'll give you an example of the feeling out process versus what you're talking about. Like we did feeling out and asking questions. And I, you know, if I had a client whose B vitamins were low, um, and I, or let's say their iron was low, but I said, I thought maybe it was a B vitamin. So I said, here, eat some more red meat. And they got better. I think it was the B it was the iron. I don't know because I can't test. Yeah. So I'm giving them suggestions and they're helping, but I don't know specifically what part of what I recommended help because foods come with many nutrients you know, uh, exercise, there's lots of different impacts it has on the body. So was it the fact that I incorporated more compound lifts? Was it the fact that the rest periods got different? Was it? And so it was, it's very, very, it's, it, it takes years and years and years to develop the sensitivity to be able to figure this out without this kind of. Oh, testing. imagine helping people break plateaus that uh, can't figure out why we're not losing weight. I'm doing this. I'm yeah. doing that. And it's like, and you're trying to guess as a coach and a trainer all the time, finally, or, yeah. or you're thinking either they're lying to me or maybe this. And then we get a test bag and go like, oh my God, their hormone levels are for all over the place. Yeah. Like, let's address that. And now we know why. And I mean, talk about taking the the frustration off the client who feels like they're trying so hard, but have no idea they're all out of, all I had out of balance. A, I had a client that we could not figure out why she was fatigued. We could not figure it out. And we did some improvements through exercise, sleep, um, nutrition, and it was just so frustrating. Couldn't figure it out. Anyway, finally, I got her to work with a functional medicine practitioner. She had high levels of, uh, I forgot which heavy metal it was, but it was so high. So she had to go detox, get rid of it, and she felt better. I would have never known. I would have never known had she not done that testing. What are the tests that people can work with through the integrative health practitioner certification? Yeah, so what we do in level two, we take people through the, what's called a big five okay. plus the bacteria and parasite stool test. So we are doing uh, what's called the candida metabolic vitamins test, also called the organic acids test. That looks at 75 biomarkers and it's just a small sample of urine. So I think that's one of the ones we may, we may even do, but it looks at all your vitamin levels, looks at mitochondrial health for energy. It's going to look at detox factors. Um, those B vitamins we were just talking about. It's going to look at candida overgrowth, potentially clostridia overgrowth, which is a nasty bacteria mm. in your stomach that you can get uh, and so much more overall metabolism. So that's an amazing lab. We look at 190 food sensitivities, but to healthy foods like eggs. Are you sensitive to eggs? Yes or no? Because if you are, and you can't lose that last five pounds and you're eating eggs every day, well, there's a reason for your inflammation and water retention. Like you're just inflamed from eating eggs. Like mm. it's a common food sensitivity. Okay. So we're testing 190 foods there. Uh, then we're doing the minerals and metals test, which we did on an episode goes through all of your minerals. So now you don't just have your vitamins, but you have your zinc and your copper and your selenium and your chromium and your magnesium. So we look at all those and it also looks at heavy metals. So your client, the mercury, aluminum, cadmium, arsenic, lead, we look at those. Um, and then we're looking at your omega-6 to omega-3 levels, plus we're looking at your arachidonic acid to EPA. Mm -hmm. So there are people that can eat uh, all the red meat in the world they want, mm -hmm. and they don't build up arachidonic yeah. acid. Some people do. 26% of the population. We're, I think we were chatting about that. It was either today or our last show. But um, a third of the population does not do well with a high-fat diet. Can I pause for a second? Yeah. So arachidonic acid is a, it's a fatty acid found in a lot of it in red meat. They, they marketed that as a muscle building supplement a while ago because they found that supplementing it with some people built more muscle. 
I bought into it. I was a kid. I took it and my joints felt like crap. So it can be very pro-inflammatory in the wrong, with, for the wrong person, right? It increases prostaglandin uh, series two. Yeah. And which is the most, one of the most inflammatory uh, processes in your body. Yeah. yeah interesting. It's awful. Yeah. So if you can't clear it, you wake up puffy and swollen, yeah. joint pain, like it's, it's miserable. So we can, we can test for that. And then EPA, um, is basically like DHA. They're both high level omega-3s, mm -hmm. but EPA can actually, uh, balance uh, arachidonic acid really well, but it can become DHA. So it's a really nice, um, omega-3, but it, it even gives you your omega-3 index. And if you're above what's called 9% saturation of omega-3s, you have a 90% risk reduction rate for dying from a heart attack, even if you have high levels of cholesterol, wow. high levels of whatever. So it's an amazing marker because heart disease isn't just about cholesterol, right? And, it's, and for some people, it has totally negligible, but it is about your arteries being constricted and inflammation can do that. So yeah, we'll is, look at that. isn't like a quarter of people who get heart attacks, something like that, or 20, it's like a substantial minority have fine blood lipids. Like their cholesterol numbers look fine yet they get heart attacks. It's literally 50-50. Oh, is it? Okay, so 50 it's more than 50% of high, 50% of low. Oh, so wow. there's much other factors. That's why you need to run homocysteine, high sensitive CRP, run your omegas. Wow. And you'll have a much better profile. I mean, now you can break down lipid profile, but yeah. And that's why, again, these lab tests are not diagnostic medical lab tests. They mm -hmm. look at the underlying root cause health issues. Um, the, uh, it looks at the hormones such as cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, thyroid that we did in the last episode. Um, so again, these are very powerful labs and the bacteria and parasite stool test. Well, if a client is bloated all the time from eating just normal food, like they won't eat meat anymore. They won't eat fish, not because that's a choice for spiritual based reasons or other. They just don't, they can't digest it. Okay. Well, why can't you digest it? We can figure that out. And so we run these labs mm -hmm. to look at that. So again, I consider them invaluable for yourself as an individual, but also be, be able to add these to the practice. You know, what's interesting, uh, Dr. Cabral, is if, and I, I know this because I had gut issues for a long time. So I did lots of reading, lots of research and um, bacterial overgrowth issues in the, you, you can treat them with pharmaceuticals, but they did a study not that long ago where they actually compared herbal micro, uh, antimicrobials, just as effective, just as effective at treating SIBO um, in individuals. In other words, you don't have to go get a prescription. You can do this with natural products you can buy over the counter. And the studies, they actually did really good studies that show it's just as effective. Are there things like that for parasites as well? Or do you have to go the pharmaceutical route for parasites? No. So we always say that if it could be diagnosed as a medical disease, the wellness client, because they're not patients, because you're not doing practicing medicine, right. can share it with their PCP. So they have the patient or the wellness client has the option of doing an antiparasitic or they have the option of the herbal-based protocols, which are work, work amazingly well. So uh, just to kind of back that up a little bit, not only do the herbals work just as well, there's no, there's not a chance of relapse. Yeah. Because when you use, I won't name the specific drug, but when you use the drug for SIBO, the relapse is so high two, three, six months later. Because what it's not doing, it's not a protocol. So we do protocols, not supplements or not drugs. So if your doctor is giving you the drug, which is an antibiotic, which probably got you SIBO in the first place, but <laughs> we won't talk about that. Um, and they're not giving you Saccharomyces boulardii to prevent the yeast overgrowth. Yes. And then they're not giving you a specific probiotic to help repopulate your gut. You're just going to hand it back where you were. Well, you, you nuke everything. For a while. You, you just nuke, nuke exactly. everything with this. With I did that. I, yeah. I nuked it and I got better. And then two months later, it came back. Well, you, you go into a garden with a flamethrower and you burn everything out, Right it eventually grows back. Mm -hmm. You didn't teach it how to grow back properly. So you get the weeds, you get everything else. Yeah. You need to repopulate in a very specific way. Yeah, very interesting. So wow, so you could do that with even with parasites. I did not, I had no idea. That's interesting. Yeah, and parasites are actually easier to work with than candida overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth because parasites are their own living thing working or inside of the ecosystem. So you're using what would be considered almost like, again, go back to the garden. The garden's fine. Maybe it's fine. Let's mm -hmm. say that. You just have parasites. Okay. Unlikely that it's fine if you have parasites, but you're going in what would be a natural a pesticide. And so you're going in with um, specific things like cloves and black walnut hulls and the things that are literally scientific proven, proven to get rid of it, plus what's called a biofilm disruptor that mm -hmm. people are start, now starting to catch out on. So you can actually get to these and you can eradicate those without having to even change the diet. Now, wow. for candida overgrowth and SIBO, you have to change the yeah. diet. So biofilm, that's where the bacteria um, almost develop like a almost impermeable wall that prevents any medicine or antimicrobials from actually getting to the bacteria to killing them. So it's like you have to break down that biofilm. 
mm-hmm. so that you can get in there and kill them. Otherwise, it's doing nothing. Did I say that? Absolutely. It's okay. basically like a roof over the house that can protect the inhabitants inside of the house. Wow. And so you use enzymes, all natural. Again, these are all natural. All natural enzymes, proteolytic enzymes and others as well, to break down that fibrin layer. It's like a gel. And then you can actually access then the parasites or bacteria or whatever. Wow. Call. Wow. That's pretty cool. So with, uh, how common, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure bacterial overgrowth is very common. Mm-hmm. How common are parasites though? People tend to think, so I, I remember learning about this myself. Cause again, I've had gut issues on and off forever. I remember thinking parasites, that's like a third world issue. Like we live in clean first world countries. And I remember what the st- statistic was, but it's like an alarming amount of people in first world countries have parasites. It's like, yeah. wh- what's the number? 25%. So one out of every four people yes. probably has a parasite. That's right. Doesn't even know it. And if you go to South America, unfortunately, <clears throat> it's it's almost one in two. Uh, it's at least 35% they found. And it is because typically you're drinking unclean water. Okay. So the unclean water, an animal, you know, went the bathroom in the water and you're drinking that now and you're going to get parasites from that. But <clears throat> in the US, people don't know it. You can get uh, parasites from a salad bar because they can be on produce. Undercooked meat, undercooked fish. Sushi. If you ate sushi, you most likely have a parasite. Yes. Unless you had strong, strong stomach acid in order to be able to kill that parasite. Because, I mean, I eat wild salmon. I know how to look for it. And when I get my frozen wild salmon, because it should be frozen for at least three days, deep freeze, and then it should be cooked all the way through for the fish, I can see the parasites. And so- What do you mean you can see them? If you, so- um, if you get salmon fillets, I'm telling you right now, they, they are, so the, the most, if you only, eat swordfish, this is why I only you certainly have parasites. <laughs> if you eat swordfish undercooked, they, swordfish is a absolutely disgusting fish. If you were to cut open the swordfish, you would see hundreds, potentially thousands of parasites. Wow. Right it's unbelievable. And so when you look at salmon, you'll, you'll see, and we teach the, we teach the parasites, like what they actually look like. Um, but they're little tiny squiggly worms. And you can actually see the grown ones. Now, most pi- parasites start off microscopic. That's the issue. Yeah. You don't necessarily see them because you wouldn't purposely eat a little worm. But they grow inside of you because they're parasitic. They literally leech off of you. Just like a tick is a parasite, well, it's a parasite on the inside. You also get internal parasites that you What are the most common ones you find here? What are they called? Uh, rope worm, tape worm, okay. pin worms. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's Was sucks. hook worm the one in the okay. south that like, just, it's uh, another one. Yeah. They used to get like a nice. bit. That wow. That's ter- affected your brain. That's terrible. Yeah, now when you, when you're doing a parasite test, uh, are they just looking at stool and looking yes. at eggs and okay. So that's, that's, and I'm glad you brought that up. The reason we use a lot of different lab tests is because every lab test is best at what it does. Mm. So we would never use a urine based test to find parasites. No. And that, that wouldn't, we wouldn't use urine to even find out your hormone markers because it just shows what's been used. It's not necessarily the best way to look at it. Not bad, but not the best way. So, if you're looking at, hey, what's in your intestines, let's do a stool test. And then if we're looking at what escaped from the gut wall, let's do a urine test. If we're looking at um, what's being excreted from the body, let's do a hair test. And uh, if we want to know best levels of hormones that are unbound, we're doing a saliva test. So wow. we have a little bit of everything for each person in order to be able to say, hey, this is what you can do. The nice thing is the thing that prevents people from running functional medicine tests is they have to have a needle put in their arm to draw blood. Yeah. Nobody likes that. Right. I don't know anybody who likes that. Okay. I, I will do it quite often. I don't like it. Plus you have to go to a lab and do the whole thing. That's right. Or you spend $150 for a phlebotomist to come to your house and all, all those different things if, you know, if it's reliable enough. So these labs allow you to reach all of your clients or additional people or family members. And it's just a little finger poke, which would be the blood spot, same as you would do for your blood sugar. Morning urine sample, saliva sample, a uh, stool sample uh, or a couple of snips of hair. And then that's it. So we've covered level one, level two coaching. Is that as far as it goes? That's what people are initially able to join with. I will say that almost 70% now people sign up for level one and level two combination yeah. because they want the access to be able to run these labs, mm-hmm. which makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, Especially if you're going to build it in, like I said, I think that's the way to go if you're a coach. It, you, if you think about it too, like just to move back to that point, If you do that as a coach or an acupuncturist or anyone doing this, you're at the top. Yes. Like, where is someone else going to go that's better than you that does that? My sales brain was already going like, if I had this, I would would guarantee money back. What what I know when I get a client who's broken, has an exercise, is out of shape, got all these issues, when I introduce strength training, uh, improve their diet, sleep, if I had access to labs like this, I would guarantee you 
that when you after you spend six months with me, you will feel you, the best you've felt maybe your whole so i'd have some sort of a guarantee money back after that and oh, i would just charge it a pr super premium the price success rate, i feel so confident to give it all back yeah success rate would go through the roof and then the value you could provide see the thing is too with a lot of coaches and trainers is they're afraid to charge x amount of dollars or more money and it's because they're not sure of their own value like you do something like this like you, you this is extremely valuable to the person and i used to do this through multiple practitioners i used to have like i said a studio and i'd have them in my studio if i could have done some of this myself i would have this would have been amazing so very cool. and, and the thing is too like <clears throat> let's say you go through the certification you're like you know what i don't necessarily feel comfortable running these labs we have people who say that, and that's okay. Because you might you get lifetime access right now. Yeah. You can continue study, continue to learn. If, if most people are able to just literally take it and run with it, and they learn with their clients, like all of us do, it's totally fine. But you can actually have one of our Equal Life Health coaches on my team read the lab for the client, give the program, and the personal trainer who's going through IHP then takes it and implements it with their client. Really? Because we talked about <laughs> this before. So great. Meaning like, we're not here to take anybody's clients. Like That's not what we do. We we don't even use our private practice. We literally read labs for people in 27 countries around the world. And we, we're running now about uh, 20,000 appointments a year. We've done well over 300,000 appointments. We have so much data. So what we do is we actually just teach to our IHPs, this is what works, this is what works, this is what works. Oh, we found something that tweaked us even a little bit better. Here's the update for that. So we're always giving updates wow. as well. Yeah. Wow. So it's wow. a, it's a lot. Awesome. So people can enter at whatever level they feel comfortable. Because let's let's face it, when you start anything new, you have the imposter syndrome, right? Yes. Like yeah. so there's a lot of people who won't get started because like, ha, ah, who am I to run a hormone lab? Who am I to run a food sensitivity test? Okay. Well, once you do it, you are that person and you can learn from doing it. But in the beginning, if you don't feel comfortable, you dip your toe in, you get the knowledge, the more you learn about it, the more professional you feel. And then inside of our IHP community, uh, we just call them study buddies. And so you match up with someone to practice these labs together and the education. And so you basically are just doing role playing, which gets you comfortable. So sick. how long, Perfect. how long does it typically take someone to get, go through and get uh, the level one, level two certification? Typically 12 weeks for level one, 12 weeks for level two. Okay. Six and months. About six months. Yeah. You can get started working right away as an IHP and put the IHP after your name, after the level one, Excellent. which yeah, people can do. Well, I, I think it's uh, one of the most valuable courses I've ever heard of. I wish, I mean, if, uh, so much cool stuff. <laughs> Makes me want I, to build an online coaching business. I bit. mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 just, right. I just want to see what oh, like, we got a backup plan. This yeah, is yeah, working. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, so very cool. We really appreciate that you offer this to, to people. And I know we're doing something for our, our audience with this. So really appreciate you coming back on the show. Yeah. My pleasure. Always great chatting with the three of you. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. This one's really important. And that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another yeah. thing. You'll see less injury as well.